Once you have marked number 304, let me encourage you to take a Bible. If, they didn't bring, if you didn't bring one with you, there should be one on the pew in front of you. Everyone, if you will, take a Bible and open it with me to the book of Galatians in the New Testament. Toward the end of God's great book, we are going to end our time today in Galatians chapter 3. I'd encourage you to place a little piece of paper or a marker there in Galatians 3. We will visit there again in just a few minutes and then ultimately end in Galatians 3. Once you've marked Galatians 3, let me encourage you to take a Bible and open it to Psalm 67. Psalm 67 is our great text for the morning. We're going to read that together in just a few moments as you're turning there to set our minds for this great privilege of hearing from God in His Word. I'd like just to read Psalm 43, verses 3 and part of verse 4. Send out your light is the prayer of the psalmist to God. Send out your light and your truth. Let them lead me. Let them bring me to your holy hill and to your dwelling. Then I will go to the altar of God, to God my exceeding joy, and I will praise you. Could I encourage you to allow the, the weight of those words the sweetness of those words to settle in on you this morning and adopt them as your own. Use them as a vehicle to, to set your mind on the privilege of coming before God today, expressing our praise to Him in song, seeking His face in prayer, and hearing from Him in this great book. In Psalm 67, you've got your Bibles open there. Would you read that with me, those seven verses? May God be gracious to us and bless us and make His face to shine upon us that Your way may be known on earth, Your saving power among all nations. Let the peoples praise you, O oh God. Let all the peoples praise you. Let the nations be glad and sing for joy. For you judge the peoples with equity and guide the nations upon earth. Let the peoples praise you, O oh God. Let all the peoples praise you. The earth has yielded its increase. God, our God, shall bless us. God shall bless us. Let all the ends of the earth fear Him. Two weeks ago, we established a, a trajectory that we hope to realize in 2012. We won't take the time to rehash all of that this morning. If you haven't gotten one of our booklets in the foyer, our, our messed up foyer this morning. We appreciate your patience as we're on the verge of making a big transition. But still in the foyer, those booklets are available that establish some personal goals and some congregational goals, making practical some of the great truths and aims that we read in Scripture for us right here at Laurel Canyon this year. One of the, the great Central themes of that goal is not only being individual followers of Jesus, but working to allow our faith to spread everywhere. Working so that as a body, the Word of the Lord would sound forth from this place in every way possible. And we turn our attention this morning to Psalm 67 because it is a great example of how to pray. In light of those goals that we've established for ourselves in 2012, we're going to talk about the links here, the significant God-breathed links that we have 
in Psalm 67. But what I would like to do is begin in the very first book. We will repeatedly return to Psalm 67. But for now, if you'll open your Bibles with me back to Genesis chapter 12. What we want to try and do this morning is appreciate the big picture of what is going on in God's great plan for this world and for us. Our place in this great story that is progressively revealed throughout the Bible and how it relates to us and what we ought to be doing and how specifically we ought to be praying in 2012. Psalm 67 has a context. It was written by a Jew, a descendant of Abraham, whose hope as a Jew went all the way back to Genesis chapter 12 where God, out of all of the people of the earth, shows Abram. And Genesis 12 and verse 1 are God's words where He says, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you, and I will make of you a great nation. And I want you to notice this next phrase. I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. That last few words, those last few words are extremely significant. God does not simply say, Abram, I have chosen you. I am going to give you a land. I'm going to make you a great nation. And I'm going to bless you. And I'm going to make your name great. Enjoy all of those wonderful things. No, there is an ultimate end. An ultimate aim to God's promises. And it is much bigger than Abram. It is much bigger than his family. It is much bigger than all of the people who would descend from Abram. More than the sands on the seashore, God promised. It's bigger than that. Abram, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to give you a land. I'm going to be with you. I'm going to be with your descendants. I'm going to make your name great so that, in order that, you might be a blessing. In Genesis 12, we get a glimpse of a great theme that resounds throughout God's book. Blessed to be a blessing. Not just blessed. Blessed to be a blessing. God wraps up in verse 3, I will bless those who bless you and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. That's an integral part of God's great plan for humanity. An integral part for God's plan for your life and for my life. It is as old as Genesis 12. I am going to bless in order that my people will be a blessing to all. We flash forward all the way back where you marked your Bibles in the book of Galatians. Turn back to the New Testament, to the other end of God's great revelation to mankind. And we find the ultimate decisive fulfillment of those promises of blessings to Abraham, how they are described as being realized in Christ Jesus. In Galatians chapter 3, read with me in verse 10. We understand Abraham has many descendants. Eventually God reveals himself powerfully. He provides a law for those descendants of Abraham and not one of them keeps it perfectly. Not one of them fulfills the righteous requirement of the law. All deserve God's condemnation. God says, do this. They don't do it. And there is a penalty attached to disobedience. God 
has a plan. We talked last Sunday morning about that eternal plan and how Jesus the Christ, the Son of God, is the great hinge of that plan. Listen to the reasoning of Paul in Galatians 3 and verse 10. All who rely on works of the law are under a curse. Why is that? Because the law pronounced this curse. Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. Paul makes it clear in his writings, all sin, all fall short of the glory of God. All fall short of the righteous requirement of the law. And unless there is something better, someone to fill the gap, there is no good news. But the reason that Paul is writing to Christians as they've been scattered throughout the region of Galatia is this. It is evident that no one is justified before God by the law. The righteous shall live by faith. But the law is not of faith. Rather, the one who does them shall live by them Christ redeemed us. This is what God provided. This is the problem. This is God's solution. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law. As lawbreakers. By becoming a curse for us. The law also said, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. Jesus the Christ did that, is what Paul is telling us. So that in Christ Jesus, notice why we went from Galatians 12 or Genesis 12 to Galatians 3. Here is the link between those two things. Christ became a curse for us so that in Christ Jesus the blessing of Abraham might come not just to Abraham's fleshly descendants but also to the Gentiles. To you and me. So that we might receive the promised Spirit through faith. This is why Jesus came. This is why He lived. This is why He died. This is why the Father rose him, raised Him from the dead. There is good news rooted in the promises of God. All the way back in Genesis 12, decisively realized in Jesus Christ. The one who lived the life we should have lived. Who died the death we should have died. Who hung upon a tree as a curse to bear the curse we deserved. So that we might be partakers of the blessings God promised about all the way back in Genesis chapter 12. There's our context. Psalm 67 has a context. Now come back with me to Psalm 67. We're right here in the middle of God's revelation to mankind. Is this psalm, this song, bringing in a sense those promises into full present view. Singing about the covenant of God. Singing about the, the promises of God. That is why you and I continue to sing. That's what we ought to do with the promises of God. Pray those promises. Sing those promises. Stir our hope in those promises. Here is a man right in the middle of God's revelation. A descendant of Abraham. An heir of Israel, the blessings of God, the covenant of God, the revelation of God, and he shows us something about God within this great overarching story context. What do we learn in Psalm 67? We learn certain things that God desires. 
Psalm 67 and verse 2, God desires to be known. The aim, verse 2, that your way may be known on earth. Your saving power, not just among the Jews, but among all nations. God desires to be known. There are certain aspects about God, about His might, about His patience, about His faithfulness that creation shows us. Paul reasons through that in Romans chapter 1. From the rising of the sun to the setting of the sun to the changing of the seasons, God shows His amazing power and His great faithfulness. But there are things that nature simply cannot teach us. God desires not just to be heard of distantly. God desires that not just a a few people would ascribe a certain amount of honor to Him and then the rest of us would just commend those people for being especially religious. God desires to be known on earth. This is very practical at the beginning of this new week. Don't just sing about God this morning. Don't just pray to God this morning. Deceiving yourself into believing that now I can live the rest of my week and live as if I know Him. You understand, husbands, if you... Talk to your wife this morning and pay her not a lick of attention for the rest of this week. You are not living as if you know her. And there will be consequences. God desires to be known. Let's live like that this week. Like it is our desire as well to know uh, as much about Him as we can possibly know. God desires, number two, verses three and five, to be praised. God desires to be known. God desires to be praised. Verse three, let all the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. If we missed it in verse three, it's there again in verse five. Let the peoples praise you. Praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. God desires to be known. God desires to be praised. God desires, number three, to be enjoyed. Look at verse four. Let the nations be glad. And sing for joy. I can know someone and not enjoy being around them. I can praise someone and have no desire to be around them. Not God. God desires to be known. God desires to be praised. God desires to be enjoyed. There is a reason that we began hearing Psalm 43 in verse 3. Let me read it to you again. Send out your light and your truth. Why? Because God desires to be known. Send out your light and your truth. Let them lead me. Let them bring me to your holy hill and to your dwelling. Then I will go to the altar of God. God desires to be known. God desires to be praised. And God desires to be enjoyed. To God my exceeding joy. And I will praise you. Could I encourage you this morning to be honest? To use God's Word as a mirror. 
And to ask yourself if that is where you are as you walk through life. Do you know Him? Are you praising Him? Have you found the joy that only He can provide? Is He this morning your exceeding joy? God, finally under that heading, number four in Psalm 67, desires to be feared. It is remarkable to me how often God balances, how wishy-washy and and flip-floppy human beings are, and how easily we will run to extremes. That as long as I enjoy God, it doesn't really matter how I live my life. Not so. Or as long as I fear God, I'm just going to grin and bear it and, and there really isn't any joy to be found whatsoever. Not so. God shows us how to hold Him as our exceeding joy. And He reminds us just how much He is to be feared. God desires to be feared. Psalm 67 verse 7. God shall bless us. Let all the ends of the earth fear Him. Think with me this morning about those four verbs. God desires to be known. God desires to be praised. God desires to be enjoyed. God desires to be feared. That is why He created this earth. That is why He chose Abraham. That is why He made a covenant with Israel. That is why His Son walked among us. That is why His Son died as a curse on a tree. That is why His Son was raised. That is why we remember in the way God has told us to remember this morning His body that was given and His blood that was shed. That is why this world continues to exist. That is why you still have breath this morning. God desires to be known. God desires to be praised. God desires to be enjoyed. And God desires to be feared. To that end, Psalm 67 shows us four more things very quickly. God aims to be known in specific ways. God aims to be known as the one and only true and living God. If I treat Him as Anything other than that, I do not know him. Psalm 63, verse, or 67, verse 3. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. Appreciate that this has a context. There is a, a man, an Israelite, praying that this God, the God of heaven and earth, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, be known and be praised. Many so-called gods at that point in history. Many so-called gods at this point in history. Listen to me this morning. We do not worship the same God as Islam. And to act as if I can involve myself in a variety of different religious schemes and ideas and opinions. We we talked about Mormonism several Sunday evenings ago. Do I know Him? Have I allowed my knowledge of Him to be shaped? Not by what any other person says, but by what He has revealed in His book. 
Isaiah 45 and verse 5 to those who would say, well, it doesn't really matter. There are many, many, many different paths, many alternatives. This God says, I am the Lord and there is no other. Besides me, there is no God. I equip you. Why? I equip you though you do not know me that people may know. Why does God continue to bless, continue to provide, continue to be patient, that people might know Him from the rising of the sun and from the west, that there is none besides Me. I am the Lord and there is no other. He is most clearly revealed in Jesus. Jesus staked His claim on this truth. He shed His blood as a testament to this fact. There is a one and only true and living God. I have come, He said in Mark 2, that those who are sick might get what they need. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners who have turned from this one and only true and living God. God aims to be known. He aims to be known as the one and only true and living God. He aims to be known as a God of justice. Listen, if I want the God of love and hope without any justice and any accountability, I do not know Him. He is a God of justice. Psalm 67 and verse 4. You judge the peoples with equity. When judgment comes, it will not be partial. It will not be based on the color of skin or the size of my brain or the place of my birth or the quality of my ancestry or the size of my bank account. No bribes will be considered. No sophisticated plea bargains. All will proceed on the basis of God's unimpeachable righteousness. The problem is I'm not righteous. I haven't done what He says. Which is why we are so full of praise this morning because of God's good news. That in Romans 5 and verse 19, as by the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners. The doors flung open. Genesis 3, because of the sin of Adam. So by the one man's obedience, Jesus the Christ, the many will be made righteous. There is a way that God can be a God of ultimate justice and righteousness and still save you and still save me. But the only way that's possible is through Jesus Christ. That is something that all need to know. We will stand on equal footing. God will do right. He will judge with Equity. There is a remedy for universal failure and rebellion. God is going to do right. Sin will be dealt with either in hell or in Jesus Christ. God desires to be known as sovereign as the one who reigns over all. Psalm 67 verse 4, you judge the peoples with equity, you guide the nations upon earth. Nations live and act and talk and boast as if they are in control, and God laughs. Acts 17 verse 26, He made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling places. 
The king's heart is a stream of water in the hand of the Lord. He turns it wherever he will. He changes times and seasons. He removes kings and sets up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. All the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing and he does according to his will among the host of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. And none can stay his hand or say to him, what have you done? Listen, this is why Jesus said what he did. In Matthew 28, verse 18, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore. Because you have been blessed, not just to be blessed, but to be a blessing. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. It's got a Psalm 67 ring to it, doesn't it? Baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. He desires to be known, feared, respected, obeyed, and treasured as gracious. Psalm 67, verse 1. May God be gracious to us and bless us and make His face to shine upon us. Verse 4 shows us this was not just for Israel. Let the nations be glad and sing for joy. This is how it relates to you this morning. This is all one enormous, wonderful, gracious plan. And it finds its climax, its ultimate fulfillment in the good news of God's grace made available through Jesus Christ. Titus 2 and verse 11 the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people. Follow it with me. Genesis 12. Abraham, I am blessing you so that you will be a blessing. Psalm 67. A prayer that God's promises would be realized. Titus 2. The good news is here. That's simple. The grace of God has appeared. We're not waiting anymore. Bringing salvation for all people. Training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions. But I don't want to live like that. Then you don't know God. You can't know God. His good news trains us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-control. But I don't want to then I am not God's. His is the path of uprightness and godly lives in the present age, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ, who gave Himself for us, who served as the curse on the tree for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for Himself a people for His own possession who are zealous for good works. God's people are blessed to be a blessing. It's everywhere. Let's have eyes to see it this morning. Verse 15. Declare these things. There's our goal. As individuals and as a body. In the language of Paul, to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. Here's our point for this morning. We are blessed as the people of God that we might be a blessing to others. It's right there, Psalm 67, 1 and 2. May God be gracious to us and bless us and make His face to shine upon us. That is our prayer and our plea today and this week and for the rest of our lives so that His way 
might be known on the earth. Let's realize our calling this morning. Not to be merely recipients, but to be channels. We are blessed to bless others. Psalm 67 verse 6 indicates more than likely this this had an immediate context of harvest time. The earth has yielded its increase. But even as all of the physical blessings of God are, are, are taken in, this psalm is all about God. God, may your name be known. May you be praised. May you be enjoyed above and beyond all of your, your gifts. May you be feared. Let's make sure that our lives this week are all about Him. I told you we would end in Galatians 3. Would you turn back there very quickly to Galatians 3. We read verses 10 through 14 that all who rely on works of the law are under a curse. Not one of us has kept it perfectly. There is good news in Galatians 3, 14. In Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles. The question is, what do I need to do? Galatians 3 and verse 6 holds up Abraham as an example. How he believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. Know then the Spirit of God says, it is those who are of faith who are the sons of Abraham. Without faith it's impossible to please God. What is the nature of faith as God describes it? The scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham. Abraham in you shall all the nations be blessed. So then again he says those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham the man of faith. And so what do I need to do in order to share in that? Don't take my word for it. Galatians 3.26 In Christ Jesus, the one who brings the salvation of God. You are all sons of God through faith. Anything I need to do? As many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free, male nor female. You are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to promise. Genesis 12, promises to Abraham. Psalm 67, prayers about the promises of God. Titus 2, the good news has come. Galatians 3, here's what you need to do. And if in any way we can help you this morning, Why do you wait? Why not come to the front of this auditorium while we stand and sing?